Okay, I'm assuming that's recording. It says it's recording. Hi, Meredith. Uh, how are you today? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing fine. How about yourself, Chris? Well, it's uh, dealing with this time difference. I'm sitting here drinking beer because it's uh, seven in the evening, 7.30 nearly here in, uh, in Europe, in the old continent. Right. So, yeah, I. Uh, it's a little, I mean, it's a Sunday and it's nice out here in San Francisco. It's not quite 1030 in the morning, but uh, I'm sure some people are drinking beer already and that's, <laughs> there's no judgment there. <laughs> no judgment at all. So you recently put out a brilliant album, which I've been enjoying. I've been listening to for that's nearly a month now um, on repeat over and over again. And uh I, I see, I mean, I've seen you've been getting a lot of uh, feedback on the album and stuff. Great, great stuff. And in fact, uh, I've got an interesting quote here from somebody in uh, Facebook yesterday talking about Meredith, uh, Meredith Edgar. This woman is the Beth Har Harmon of Bay Area folk music. <laughs> I had to, I, I admit, I had to look up who, who is uh, Beth Harmon. I know who Meredith Edgar is, but who is, uh, who is uh, Beth Harmon? Would you describe uh, your music as folk music? Um, I've never known how to describe my music. I feel like I've always, um, you know, as long as I've been playing, you know, I, I mostly play with an acoustic guitar. So I feel like most people look at that and say it's folk music, mm -hmm. even though I, I kind of consider folk more, I don't know, like what, people who are singing about either very old stories, you know, like the lyrics have been kind of passed down and morphed over generations or something, or, or they're singing about the government or something, mm -hmm. which, you know, and I don't do either of those very much, um, if at all. So, but I have no problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of whatever it be, as long as if, if people, it was a, that was a very nice, um, a very generous, very nice quote from Maurice Tanney, who's a very well-respected uh, songwriter and musician here in the Bay Area. So that was, that was very cool. Okay, well, I mean, the album's been out, as I said, uh, three, nearly nearly a month now, and I, I've mm -hmm. listened to it. I wouldn't say, I, I mean, I would say there's some folky elements on there, but there's a lot of other, a lot of other um, sources and and a lot a lot of depth, I think, to the to the album. Um, it's been a strange time. It's obviously uh, all the time we've been going through. How did you decide to put out an album during this time? Um, I guess, you know, I, um, well, I had, I had been living abroad and I moved back to the States right before COVID started. And it was with the intention for, <laughs> which is hilarious, but, uh, the best laid plans. Um, I, I moved back with the intention to really put more time and effort into, um, making, music and and making that a, a bigger part of uh how i spent my time um kind of uh and and making an album putting out a proper album was part of that because i hadn't done that really before um so i knew i was gonna i wanted to do that and then covid hit and everything shut down and i was pretty sure that i was not going to be able to do that um but then I wound up uh, being lucky enough to find Women's Audio Mission, which is a, an incredible nonprofit here in San Francisco. Um, and I believe because they have nonprofit status and they have a studio where they do a lot of, um, they, people can go in there and rent the space and, and services and record albums, but um, they also use it for educational purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, so... I was able to go in there and record when pretty much everything else was closed. Um, so once I figured out I could do it in the middle of a pandemic, I, I jumped on it. Yeah, and I, and I I saw that you you financed that by like a GoFundMe by a, a crowdfunding thing. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, was was that a very complicated thing? Also, in these times, I mean, with everybody, you know, some people people being out of work, people you know, having difficult times and things to, I mean, and there's a lot of the uh, kind of crowdfunding things going around, but I mean, yeah. you, you reached your target and more, I believe. So. Yeah. Um, 
I had never done a crowdfunding um, anything before, and I was I I was initially kind of uncomfortable with the idea of doing that, um, but. Uh, and especially, frankly, just in the context of it was, um, you know, the BLM movement had was really going at that time. I mean, it still is, but it was kind of, you know, growing exponentially, the awareness about it at that time. Um, and I knew that uh, it was a complicated thing to ask um, especially as a white woman to ask for uh, people to donate to something that was not, you know, that was kind of an elective thing. Um, but I, you know, kind of consulted with a lot of friends and other musicians and, you know, people said, go ahead and do it. Like there are people who would want, who want you to make an album mm -hmm. and the, the worst that can happen is people say no. Um, right. So I did, I went ahead and did it and, you know, um, pointed out that there are a lot of other places that people should also be donating to, mm -hmm. um, but that if they wanted to support the album, this is, this is a thing. Um, and I was, people were incredibly generous and um, wound up, I still, I wound up spending more money than what I said is my budget, mm -hmm. um, but it still, it helped, it made it possible. The mm -hmm. GoFundMe absolutely made this album possible. But I, th I think also it's looking at kind of criteria and and you know where to put where to donate and things. I think it's during this period art has become you know it's, it's kind of getting people through you know music uh, any any form of art and everybody isolated being online and whatever you know doing you know entertainment or whatever it is being exclusively online i mean i think it's incredibly important it's although the music business has shut down it's in a way it's really revealed just how important you know kind of art and culture is in people's lives as well not just uh, yeah. you know the kind of other causes and things but like more you know on a kind of more um existential or spiritual level or whatever it is that people have needed there so i think you know i think in a way that kind of reflects it and the the material from the album is was any of it new or was any, was any of it written during this period or was it um, songs you've been working on for some time or how how did you choose the was, material? Yeah, it was a mix. Um, a lot of the songs, some of the songs I wrote a very long time ago, and um, the album that I had kind of half acidly put out in 2011 called Water Gun, um, uh, which Paul Griffith, who was we play as a duo and as part of a trio and he played on almost every song on this album he played on water gun as well so um that uh some of the songs from that album i just kind of wanted to redo kind of rearrange and and re-record them um with the experience more experience mm -hmm. and more intention um so there are a couple songs that are you know like 10 plus years old um, there are some songs that I've written, you know, within the last few years. And then there are, I think, two, two songs that I wrote during quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, uh, which one? Pinned, I wrote. That was the newest one. And we actually were still kind of working out the arrangement in studio. That was the, which we didn't expect. Um, and then Hammer and Nail. I wrote, um, I kind of finished that just in time for the tiny, the NPR tiny desk contest mm -hmm. in 2020, because I wanted to enter again and wanted to put something new in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a mix of old and new. Mm -hmm. Hammer and Nails, funny, uh, you mentioned that's my favorite. That's my favorite Meredith Edgar song. <laughs> and uh, one that I play along with on, on this is my... Uh, this is a tenor baritone, and oh, wow. I play. I play along. I, I play along to you on that. And I, in fact, I've actually got a setting in a in an amp sim that is actually called Hammer and Nail because that's the oh, one that's I, so use. Cool. <laughs> I, I use on that. So I'm thrilled to actually have because I, I used to uh, strum along. I used to play along to the uh, the Tiny Desk version. 
So now it's great to have this. But I see that not only me doing doing that, but I see like other other people out in in the wild are uh, taking your songs and doing doing things with them. I see. I I, I believe that like somebody translated uh, a song, uh, one song off the album, and did like a lyric video up on on YouTube, and uh, mm -hmm. somebody else is um, working out the chords to the stuff and putting it on like Ultimate Guitar, you know, and things like this. Yeah, that was really cool. Those were both very cool things to to see, like going on. Yeah, there was a someone for some for some reason the um, apparently I'm big in Brazil, um, okay. or you know that's a um, like the I think second to the U.S. Brazil is like where most of the plays of mm -hmm. like on Spotify and Apple Music and stuff. That's where most of the plays have come from. Um, and yeah, someone did a Portuguese translation of my song Tidal Waves with this like really pretty background in the video. And um, that was really neat. And then, yeah, just go go on Ultimate Guitar and see my, which I use all the time because I love mm -hmm. like working out kind of different arrangements. And I just, I, I love playing covers at home and, you know, and for gigs just for fun. Um, and yeah, I use that side all the time. I was like, damn, I'm on all the way guitar. And that's kind of, and I think they got the chords right too. Yeah, I was going to say, because a lot of stuff on Ultimate Guitar often is, yeah, it's not so good. And then you've got all these kind of trolls and discussions, you know, going mm -hmm. on there. But you know, I, I was playing, I, I, I uh, took the chords from that and played along and it, see, it seemed fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on that. But I, I see you've also got like um, some, um, response because you, you've got a couple of songs on a on a video game that came out ar around the same time how, how did that how did that come about yeah it was very much around the same time um the video game coming out was kind of my deadline for getting my album out because okay. I knew that you know there was just you know I wanted I knew that people would hear the music in the video game and I wanted to have some you know I wanted to have some some other music available and have those songs available online because I didn't for a while. Um, but then because of COVID, there were all these delays with the album. So it wound up, I wound up releasing my, the new album on Whatever You Pray the day before Maquette, the, the video game came out. So it was very, it was a very busy week. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, basically the um, creator of the game, Hanford Lamour, uh is a a very good a very old friend of mine um and he's been talking about making this game as long as i've known him and he had the idea before i met him which was uh like 15 years ago more maybe more than more than 15 years ago now um and uh he always liked my music and had you know um when he started actually making this game once it got uh, taken on by Annapurna Interactive. He talked about wanting to very specifically make the whole soundtrack um, all like curate a soundtrack ra rather than just kind of like find music that sounded good in the background or whatever, which I guess is closer to what um, most video games do for their soundtracks. And the game's set in San Francisco and he wanted everything to just be super San Francisco and like adhere to that theme. So it's all San Francisco musicians um, and or uh, songs about the city. Um, so yeah, and just there were a couple of my songs, there's Tidal Waves and then Blue. Um, I recorded a, a special version of Blue, like just on the electric guitar, um, just for the, the soundtrack. And uh, yeah, it's great. And I, I think, I mean, it's very cool to be included on on the soundtrack. There's some amazing music. There's like Jay Som, who's fantastic, mm -hmm. is on there. Um, a lot of other really great people. And Gabor, what is the intro song? I can never say his name correctly, like Gabor Sabso or something. Mm -hmm. There's a song called Warm San Francisco Nights from like the 60s. It's a mm -hmm. very, very cool song. Anyway, let's see. And have you played the game? I have not yet. I want <laughs> to, but it's been a busy month and I haven't got I haven't gotten around to it yet. Also, I don't have I think it's only been out on PlayStation so far. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it's out on Steam. 
uh, for like max mm-hmm. yet or whatever, but that's the only way I would be able to play it. So, yeah. so you, you mentioned there the, you know, the album release and things. What, what is that like releasing an album in this kind of context? Obviously, you know, the release parties, the, the kind of typical things you would do, that's not there, I'm guessing. So what is an album release like <laughs> in, in, this, in this time, in our times? Well, I was really uh, improvising. I, I really did not know what the fuck I was doing um, at all. <laughs> so, and it, this was very DIY. Mm-hmm. Um, and as much as I tried to research how to do it properly, um, I, I, I was really, I felt like I was just kind of like clawing in the dark, trying to see, you know, if I could, if I was doing things well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't an opportunity to have, like normally I would think at least, or I would want to have like a big CD release concert or not CD, album, album mm-hmm. release concert. Um, and, uh, you know, I did have a couple like pandemic gigs mm-hmm. where you know we we treated them as album release gigs but it's 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 hard to do that right now um luckily san francisco has some venues open uh like for outdoor music mm-hmm. but it's still a lot of people don't really know and and a lot of people are of course not comfortable going out quite yet which is good you know um mm-hmm. but yeah it was tricky and um, for me doing, it was my first time really doing the digital release and having the distribution be across all of these different uh, channels. And uh, I can't really say that I know what I did. I just kind of did, <laughs> <laughs> I just, was just kind of like reading some things and pressing buttons and be like, yeah, that seems that seems good. Put it there, like, let's just, yeah. Um, I don't know. I probably did a lot of things wrong, but I did. I did learn a lot in the process. So, well, I, I, as a listener, as a as a, a viewer of this process, you know, it all seemed to go. It all seemed to work, and you know, the album came out when you said it was going to come out, and you know, you could download it, and it was streaming and things, and uh, so it seems seems like it all worked. Yeah. And, Thank you. I hope so. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it, it seemed, uh, it, 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 it was, to be honest, it was interesting um, because I knew this, the, the album was coming out. So uh, uh, from that perspective, it was actually interesting to watch as well to see, you know, how, how did that work in that, in that context? Because I see a lot of people on social media talking about this kind of process, talking about, you know, oh my God, what do we do? Because, you know, we have no record label and we've got no this and we've got no that and you know mer- we depend on merch sales and band camp and and obviously yeah. people that have never done this before and i've seen um you know also in the kind of facebook videos and instagram you know that when you've been doing facebook live things you know and suddenly all these people that have never had to do any of this stuff before have suddenly you know had a steep learning curve in the last year where yeah it's, oh shit I can't just go and play I can't just go and play in the bar or in the club anymore I have to find a different way to get to get to get stuff out yeah yeah definitely the doing the I really didn't use Instagram very much like almost at all until mm-hmm. I moved back to the states and was and then lockdown happened and I was just kind of like well this is it seems like one of the few ways that you know i'll be able to not just i mean connect connect with friends for one thing you know Mm -hmm. i kind of really appreciated social media for that this last year um since we couldn't see each other in person even even people who i live you know in the same city as Mm -hmm. um but then also definitely just for yeah for putting music out and just i don't know doing little home home videos and home concerts and stuff like that was, you know, it was, it's, the energy is so different from playing in mm-hmm. front of actual people, you know, physically, but it, I really got me through in a lot of ways. It was just, it is kind of a better than nothing situation, but mm-hmm. it was also 
it had more weight than that within the context of, of COVID and the quarantine, just being super isolated. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. talking talking of that energy thing you mentioned, um, how was that in the recording studio? Because the the the, the album sounds great. I mean, it, I think the, the production's great. It, it sounds, you know, it do, doesn't necessarily sound like it was created in some sort of crazy conditions, but I'm guessing that being in the studio wasn't the typical being in the studio experience. Yeah, I mean, again, like I haven't, I'm really not, um, I haven't done a lot of, I've only been in a studio really one other time. Mm -hmm. um, there was one time where I recorded some harmonies for one of Paul Griffith's past albums, um, but uh, but where I just kind of sat in a couple days for a couple hours doing some harmonies and stuff, but other, but for my own albums and, you know, I've, I did Water Gun in 2011, that was, um, with friends of mine who had uh, attended Expression Center for New Media, which is like a, a media school in Emeryville, California, kind of on the other side of the bay. Um, and they had they were alumni and they wanted to help me record an album, you mm -hmm. know? And so we did that, but it was a very different setting and very different situation. Um, and this, so that I don't have a lot to compare the experience to, I guess, mm -hmm. but there is the fact that, yeah, there was only, um, we had one recording engineer, um, Veronica Simonetti, and she was amazing and made it very, um, a lot less intimidating than I anticipated it would be because it's, there was a big learning curve for me and unfamiliar, unfamiliar territory. Um, but yeah, I mean, we had to kind of stay a bit apart and we were all wearing masks and we had to get like have our temperatures checked and record them whenever we went mm -hmm. into the studio and um I was the only one who had got to have my mask off at any point and it was because I was doing when I was doing vocals I was in the isolation booth mm -hmm. so you know closed doors and then I could see uh Paul and Sean Silverman our bassist um, you know, with their setups that they're having to wear masks the whole time. We're there for, you know, eight hours or whatever. It's um, a little rough. You can kind of <laughs> one, I will say one side effect, mm -hmm. uh, which you can definitely hear is, um, and Paul might kill me. I'm sorry, Paul. Okay. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I, he's, I, he's a very nice gentleman. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh <laughs> on tidal waves on the, the new recording of tidal waves paul was playing paul plays mandolin on that song which we had to mic it didn't plug directly in and so and also you know he's holding you don't like have the mm -hmm. mandolin hanging down you know um so it's like pretty high up and it's mic'd and you can hear him breathing okay i'm gonna go back because and <laughs> <laughs> well it's good he was breathing <laughs> He's breathing in this. So he's joked a bunch about like, oh, I'm always congested. And now everyone will know. But it's, you know, he's also he's wearing a mask and playing mm. and it's right here. So there's no, there's no, you know, not catching that mm. in the audio. And there's no way. And because it's a mic, it's, you know, there's, there's no way to, to take that out. So if you listen really closely, or maybe not so closely, even to, to tidal waves, you can mm. hear some breathing. But because it's this kind of ominous song, yeah. I kind of I felt like it kind of worked. <laughs> At least I'm telling myself that. So <laughs> I, I I mean I've listened to it a ton of times and I've not heard it. So and I've listened. Okay. I've listened pretty closely. I've listened on the headphones and stuff. And I'm sure Paul won't mind you sharing his story. <laughs> Not with me, at least. With, with the audience, I don't know. Right. I, I go back to 1984 with Paul. So that, right. that's, that's how I came across you. So that, You've heard him breathing before. I have heard him breathing, yes. that's. Um, <laughs> I've been in lots of situations with Paul. Um, you've had this crazy year. You've got your album out. You've recorded your album in strange circumstances. You've learned crowdfunding you've you're, an, you're a social media expert what what are, are you are you able to write songs in this uh, context uh, I, I see a lot of creators a lot of people saying that they they're finding they know something's going on inside them and sometimes something will come out 
but mm-hmm. they're finding it um, difficult to articulate or they or just the experience of living through what we're we're living through it doesn't seem to be conducive to mm. uh, to to creating new stuff are you finding that or is it uh, something that's inspiring for want of a better word or it's something that's pushing you to create um I don't know I mean at the moment like I that song that song hammer and nail that I wrote is definitely about things that happened just before and then during uh quarantine um I feel and I mean there's a reference there there's a line in it that says you know um uh like you're packing the last of your things when the, while the end of the world arrives and that that's that was a pretty uh, uh, you know not a veiled reference to the, mm-hmm. the, what has felt like a very long end of the world um so i mean i was able to write that and then that song pinned during quarantine um but I haven't really, I haven't completed a song since recording the album. Um, I feel like for one thing, I was just kind of exhausted. I, I don't think I was definitely exhausted. Um, and then after the release and, and kind of since then, this month has been um, really, really busy. Um, especially because I have, I have a day job. I have a full-time day job mm-hmm. that I work Uh, luck that I'm fortunate to have but I'm doing that you know 40 hours a week and then trying to get a lot of other things done in my free time Mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so I've I've written bits and pieces of things like lyrically um over the last few months so I have a couple notebooks with a bunch of random little bits of things that I've kind of collected and I'm I feel like I'm on the verge of writing a few new songs Mm -hmm. but yeah I haven't kind of I think I'm still feeling the um kind of aftershocks of the recording and then and then the release uh, actually putting the music out into the world um and I haven't really and I've, I've, I haven't had uh, a lot of free time, um, it, at least where I had the energy to, ju- mm-hmm. to kind of just like sit and be present with the stuff that I've written and really put something together. I feel like I'm almost ready to do that, okay. but I haven't quite gotten there yet. Well, we'll be looking forward to it. The, um... no, my internet's dropped. Oh, no. Oh, there you are. We're back. Okay. I'm back. We're back. <laughs> unstable. My my computer tells me I'm unstable again. That's how they get you. Yeah, definitely. The um gaslighting computers. Yes. The, always, always after me. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, the uh the end of the world thing, I, I assumed that was just a, an ongoing motif because you have the the song I will hold <laughs> you at the end of the world. So I just assumed I, I didn't read any of that into that. I just kind of looked at that and said, well, ah, this is an ongoing, you know, theme that pops That's up. That's fair. Yeah. That is fair. Uh, yeah, I have the, yeah, what um, Paul Griffiths dubbed my Apocalypticana song. <laughs> uh, and I will hold you at the end of the world. That was, that was, and frankly, I mean, especially, yeah, in America, I mean, this is, my position anyway basically since 2016 you know it's felt like the end of the world like mm-hmm. it, things got uh politically and otherwise got got pretty awful um that's a stupid understatement to make um but uh yeah i wrote i wrote that song um or at least started writing it and came up with the name of it while i was having a a series of rolling panic attacks on election night on 20 in 2016. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm not exact. That's literally that is what was happening. I thought I mm-hmm. I had nine one one pulled up on my phone. I was ready to call because I was pretty sure I was dying. Uh, so yeah, yeah. And I tried to write I tried to write a love song, but it wound up being <laughs> a love song taking place in, during the apocalypse. So that's just that's just how I do. Okay. Well. <laughs> creates great art, so that's good. I mean, and the other thing, the only the only at least on the album, the only thing that seems more explicit than that is American news, which uh, 
to be honest, I was like, like singing, kind of humming along one day, and I was like, who the, who wrote that? Who wrote Aww. that? And I was like, is that Steve? Uh, I, I was literally, is that Steve Earle song? And Ooh. which was, yeah. And then I was like, oh no, 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 no. Then it was like, a, it was the, it was a Meredith Edgar song, and I was like. Damn, that's a that's a Steve that's, that's like cool. up there with a the Steve Earl song, but the, it's it's very I think that the it's different to the to the other to the other material on the thing in the sense that it's more explicit. Um, yeah, definitely. Is that yeah? I'm not used to writing. Yeah, I I was I was a little nerve. I don't like, especially when it comes to, well, yeah, just kind of with everything. I don't by nature I don't really write very explicitly and um I think anyway and then especially when it comes to I feel like writing about anything political it's just so it's not that it shouldn't be done it should mm -hmm. be done um and it's some people can write about um politics and um you know social conflicts very explicitly and do it very well I mean um, but uh, some, but it's so easy for it just to be this horrible cliche that takes away from the the importance of the subject matter. Mm -hmm. I find, and so I really didn't want to do that. Um, so I was, I you know, I that song is very like borderline for me. Like I'm proud of it, and I think it came out well. But there are definitely even end of the world. End of the world has a couple lines that I I rewrote because I was just like, oh, this really, I don't know. I felt like it kind of distracted from the weight of what I was trying to mm -hmm. refer to. And I didn't want to, yeah, pretend. I didn't want to make it seem like those things weren't important or very heavy. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's tricky. It's really tricky to write about that, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I think, I, I think it comes over as, it's, it comes over as explicitly about what it's about, but but certainly a very personal perspective on it as well. I think, and it, of that song, I just, I just think it comes over really well. And literally, I was going, "Who the hell wrote? That? Who, where do I know that song <laughs> from?" So, you know, it was it was uh, very interesting from that. You put the album out. Um, the way you talk about it, it seems like it's your kind of, you know, you say it's the first time you went in into the studio. You'd done this previous thing. This mm -hmm. seems more like a an album. This is my album. How does that feel? Putting that out in the world. How scary or or exciting, exhilarating, or whatever is that? Apart from not sleeping and doing your day job and, all the, <laughs> and doing all the other things. Yeah, there's been a lot of that. Um... You know, I think the recording of it and everything was very exciting. It was it was a lot more exhausting than I expected it to be. I think because going and recording these songs, I didn't, I wasn't, um, I was just so, ex I was nervous to do it, but then I was also so, uh, it's just like, well, this is what I want to spend my time doing. So this is fun. And then I would be like completely just, fucked at the end of the day just like exhausted and brain dead and like what like why am I so tired and it's like oh it actually it is a lot of work and it's very exciting you know you're tapping into the emotions of the songs and stuff um so once it came out or what once I was done with the recording I did feel I was really excited and then there were just a bunch of delays because of COVID in terms of getting the last bits of it done kind of post-production and then like getting images to use for the cover and or and thing and promo and stuff like that which you have to have to even just upload digitally you know mm -hmm. to have stuff for say online so um uh so there was a it was a little bit of um what do you call it my brain's doing a thing uh a little anticlimactic mm -hmm. a couple weeks after the recording because def like we got it I got everything mastered um, and uh, by Jessica Thompson, who did a, a fantastic job. Um, and then, yeah, and then it was just, it was like a lot of hurry up and wait. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, and then finally getting it out um, was pretty stressful and kind of rushed, but um, 
it's been, it's been very exciting. Like it's been, I was definitely nervous. I didn't know what people were going to think. And unfortunately I'm one of those people who does care mm-hmm. <laughs> about what, you know, I really, I did. I mean, you know, I, ex- I don't expect that everyone, it's going to be something everyone's going to like at all, but, um, but, you know, I was hoping to, that people wouldn't just be like, well, this really sucks. Like this is <laughs> worthless and shouldn't have been put out like why would you you know you mm-hmm. imagine that those kind of things might happen but um it's, it's been really exciting I guess for me the the big thing about it has been that it's the first time like I'm used to just I'm, I love performing and performing is what is the like core of what I do as a musician personally normally <laughs> in normal times anyway mm-hmm. um and so I'm, I'm used to getting feedback from like the few people who are in the place where I'm performing and then maybe a few people online, you know, on social media or something and friends of friends, friends of fellow musicians. But so with this and because of the album coming out and being online and then the at maquette, the game coming out, which really, you know, um, made it possible for a my music to get heard by a lot more people and by audiences that I wouldn't normally, that probably wouldn't normally have heard my stuff. It's been so cool to just hear from complete strangers, like halfway across the world that, you know, a song really means something to them. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy, but that's, but I, that's been fantastic. It's been so cool. Yeah, I, I guess it must be kind of strange in the sense that when you sing, as you say, you're playing in a in a in a concert or whatever, it's very immediate. Mm-hmm. Um, but when somebody's got your album and they can like listen to it again and again and sit down and look at the look at the lyrics, which maybe you can't even hear sometimes when you're in a live thing. I mean, it, my Definitely. old band we we used to actually hand out flyers with some with the song with some song lyrics on, because That's we sang cool. it we sang in English in Spain, so we would actually hand out flyers with we would take a different song each time and hand those things out, um, you know, just to kind of get around that. But it's um, I guess it's very different, as you say, if somebody half around halfway around the world is going, oh, your song means something to me because they like listening to it again repeatedly, looking at and looking at the lyrics, looking at that in a sense, is very different from performing when it's the vibe, it's the, the evening, yeah. it's the show, whereas when people are spending time with your lyrics, do you, do you feel exposed by that kind of, you know, people, beat someone halfway around the world, like sitting down and really looking at your lyrics? As a songwriter, do you feel more? Um, no, I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, it's been, it's felt strange to get like messages from people who I don't know saying your music means something to me. Like it's, it's nice. It's don't get me wrong. Like it's a nice thing, but it does feel <laughs> there's part of me that's just like, who are you and why are you <laughs> reaching out to me? And it's like, Oh yeah. Like you're supposed to like fans are supposed to be a, a good thing, right? Like this is a good thing. Um, and it is, but I'm just not used to hearing from absolute strangers. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, um, so it's been, and there have been a lot and it's been really nice. Um, I don't think I feel exposed so much. I'm, it, it, I think it's, if people take the time to read the lyrics, you know, cause I think, I think for the most part, people don't pay attention to lyrics all that much. I do. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there's plenty of music that I listen to where I don't necessarily think the lyrics are the strong point of the music, some of the pop and rock stuff I listen to, and I love the music anyway, because it's mm-hmm. great, you know, the songs are great. But for my own stuff, like the lyrics are how the songs start. Um, like the songs are all based on the lyrics. So if people are interested in that and they take the time to seek out the lyrics or really listen and, you know, I think that's amazing. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. I don't, I don't feel exposed by that. I'm taking time to translate them into other languages and things it's just oh my god it's amazing yeah it's it's absolutely crazy it's very cool yeah, it's yeah. Great. the um I know from some of your live shows uh you do when you were speaking about pop and rock and things there you do you do a killer version of a of a song that I particularly like um back to me oh yeah, yeah. 
um, and I know you've got an electric guitar. So is this a new, is this a, a, a direction you're going to go in, rocking out and electric guitars and stuff? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> I hate to disappoint you. I feel like, uh, I mean, yes, I have been, I've been borrowing a really beautiful Gretsch Streamliner from a friend of mine um, because I, I used to, I had a Gretsch 1960 anniversary, diamond anniversary, like, um, you know, smoke green, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, neighbors are in the halls or like, get some noise very thin walls in this apartment mm -hmm. um and uh i have been really wanting to find an electric that that, that feels good and feels comfortable for me because i'm so used to playing my gibson jumbo which and i play with heavier gauge strings like medium or heavy strings usually and so normally when I pick up an electric, I just kind of mash all the strings onto the fingerboard. I'm just like, like I must dominate the strings and you don't need to do that with an electric. Um, so I've been, anyway, I've been playing around with that, but as much as I, I love the idea, like there's a lot of rock music that I love and I love the idea of playing that kind of music some, but what I'm looking at right now is doing more like, kind of going in the opposite direction with the electric, just super, super spare and mm. lots of reverb, just like dripping with reverb. Um, I really like, um, I'm thinking of kind of like, uh, I don't know, there are a bunch of people, but like maybe like mellower Ravenette songs or something just like kind of cinematic, mm -hmm. very reverby, spare, electric um that sounds that would that would be really nice background music for like a midnight walk through a desert you know or something mm -hmm. i don't know that's what i see like kind of cinematic and um that would fill that would be kind of a full sound but um not need me to play a whole lot to get a lot of sound from the guitar so that i can really mm -hmm. focus on my vocals okay um that was a very long answer. <laughs> it's okay. So uh, and the, the passion with which you described the, the 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 color of the Gretsch, that's just, you know. It was, I'm very, <laughs> you can't see the other stuff in my apartment. I'm not mm -hmm. going to show you right now because it's kind of a mess, but uh, mm -hmm. like green, yeah, green's my favorite color. Like green and teal are kind of like, I'm just, I'm kind of obsessed and that it was this gorgeous pistachio, kind of a pistachio green two-tone it was just yeah i want everything in my life to be that color <laughs> um but i didn't but the guitar needed a lot of work and i never got it set up properly and uh this scratch the streamliner is just it has a nicer feel to it like this mm -hmm. i feel i and i don't know enough about guitars to be able to explain exactly why but my friend lent it to me because he was like, I think this might be a better Oh, that's, that's not going back then, right? <laughs> it is. So it is, but I'm looking for it. I'm giving him this one back because it has, um, for one thing, it's red, which is mm -hmm. nothing against red, but personally, I want mm -hmm. green. green. <laughs> <laughs> I want the aesthetic does matter. I think it makes it sound better when you, when you're happy with the color. Um, so I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at, they do make, a Gretsch, uh, the same model streamliner in Torino green. But the only problem is it either comes with a Bigsby, mm -hmm. which I don't think I want because I worry about it staying in tune. And I'm just not sure I want the extra thing. Mm -hmm. I'm just not ready for that yet. So it either comes with a Bigsby or it comes without a Bigsby, but left handed. So mm -hmm. I'm basically looking at making a Frankenstein guitar, like getting mm -hmm. one or the other and having someone. Yeah. No, you can Maybe. swap out. You can swap out the Bigsby and put a stop stop tailpiece on it. You can take the take the Bigsby off. Right. That can work. Right. I mean, it's pretty. I think that's pretty straightforward. Okay. If that, if okay. that's the guitar for you, I mean, but I was saying that it, it's funny because Paul, that, Paul, that you've mentioned so many times, gave mm -hmm. me an acoustic way back, mm -hmm. and that acoustic is in Spain with the songwriter with the singer and songwriter of our old band, and it. She wrote all of the band songs on that guitar. It became, and it, it, it just, it's just, 
it's known as Paul's guitar, but it lives, <laughs> it lives there and that's where it stays. So guitars can have that thing of just finding where it should be. And so that's all I'm saying. Yeah. yeah or you I could re, re, respray that one and, you know, that, there you go. You, you, you <laughs> now. I'm not going to deface an instrument like that. I'm not the right, I'm not crafty. I'm not the right person to do that kind of stuff. But, green. It's, but it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, you're green now. No, but it, it, I mean, I uh, seeing you like seeing the Kathleen Edwards thing, because I know you have like, you know you say on on the release you know you've got these kind of different influences and all these kind of things which which are present in your work but I do think you you've got your own style and go beyond that I mean there's other influences I hear listening to you um, I hear Patsy Cline for example that's somebody you haven't mentioned oh, cool. or uh, you know whatever and as you say when I'll you did the it. That, yeah, it's not bad. That version, <laughs> no. the, the, the version of blue when with the with the uh, with the electric as well. When you talk about uh, these, these kind of directions, so I think it's very interesting. These kind of things. It's uh, yeah, the electric can take it take it in into into other fields as well. Mm -hmm. And what you know, the, we assume hopefully sometime <laughs> this year or in the not too distant future things will change and get back um do yeah. you, do you, how's that going to be getting back because i know you've been performing the kind of socially distanced in the street with masks behind a window that thing looks really strange when i see that it on, is. unlike facebook and you, i saw you and paul up there like kind of shop shop mannequins or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And I quite, what I, I, are you singing behind glass and then there's like speakers outside or something yeah so my one of my i have a friend lila who's also a musician she calls it musician jail um and yeah that's at that's at a motto's that's in the in the mission district and uh it's a great before the shutdown they were i mean they have um indoors they have two amazing just two great performance spaces that you can do kind of casual smaller groups up on the top level and then they have this basement they turned into this venue with amazing sound and um of course they had to improvise during covid so they were doing outdoor performances for a while and and i played out there with paul um and sometimes sean i guess a, a handful of times and then um, eventually, just pretty recently, like last couple months, they started, they have this uh, mezzanine indoors in the main space, this kind of like indoor balcony that goes all the way around the space. And the front has, uh, uh, faces the, the street, kind of the front and where they have a parklet set up outside for customers and it's all glass at the front. So basically, the top half of the windows fold out, like open mm -hmm. up. So they put the PA with the speakers facing okay. out there. And then Paul and I play and another, they have, they have bands, you know, a few times a week now. Um, and we're still masked and distanced and everything. And um, it's this huge airy space. So it's, you know, we felt after a certain point anyway, uh, felt comfortable performing there that way um but yeah it's it's weird but it's very strange and yet at the same time it's the closest thing to a normal indoor gig mm -hmm. that we've had in a year so because playing outdoors you know we play it we've played outdoors at a few places here um you know outside charlie's cafe and the right spot and outside at amato's and just you know we're in san francisco there's tons of street noise mm -hmm. you get you breathe in all this exhaust from you know FedEx trucks going by and like um it's just it's really loud and the sound is hard to manage mm -hmm. and it's hard to manage in a tight little you know balcony indoor space in front of glass too because the sound's reflecting back to you but at the same time it's like it's also just not cold in there okay. which um <laughs> I I have I have uh Raynaud's syndrome which is a like a circulatory thing. So my my fingers go completely blanched and white and numb uh, when they're exposed to cold. Um, it's good for, for a guitar player. Yeah, it's very convenient. It's fucking great. Um, so playing outdoors this year and in San Francisco, which is typically not a warm 
city uh, has been really problematic and I get really grumpy at gigs sometimes because it's just so frustrating between the, between the noise and then mm-hmm. just like halfway through the set, not being able mm-hmm. to finger pick. Cause I can't on this hand, I can't feel mm-hmm. the chord patterns and, or the formations. And then on this hand, I can't tell which strings I'm picking and it gets really frustrating. So playing at Amato's and playing in the window, even though it's, see, I know it's bizarre, but man, it's <laughs> the temperature control is, um, it's a gift. No, it um, just looks really strange. You see like it's weird. each yeah. in your own windows and thing. Talking about that, yeah. I mean, the, the quote I mentioned at the beginning came from uh, somebody in, uh, you mentioned as a well-respected musician and songwriter in, in the community. Yeah. It seems you have a very close knit uh, community uh, in San Francisco, in or in the Bay Area, uh, of you, right? Well, I see all, all of you guys on your social media, and you see very, very supportive, and it's a very creative environment to be in. Um, d- does that influence your your work, your writing, being part of that? I mean, and if you're separated from that, do you notice? Um, I don't know exactly how. I so, I mean, just full disclosure, I kind of didn't get I feel like but besides the fact that I've or between the fact that I've moved away from the city a couple of times um and I've also had some fairly long stretches of time where I wasn't really performing Mm -hmm. very much um uh and so I don't know this frankly this is it's very strange but this last year has been the first time that I've really made an effort um not because I didn't want to before but there were some just some various reasons why Mm -hmm. I wasn't really able to um just kind of go out and do whatever I wanted when I wanted and um now uh this year I've been able to just kind of like when there is music um you know go out and go hear and support some of the other musicians who I've admired from the area, but who I didn't really get to like go meet mm-hmm. or like really go go here very often. Um, and so few of us have been fortunate enough to have pandemic gigs mm-hmm. um, that I've gotten definitely to, I've definitely gotten to know um, more musicians in the area better this year, which is so strange, but um, I feel like I'm more involved in the community now than Mm -hmm. I was in the past when it was when frankly when there were more opportunities um but it's been very it's been fantastic I I do think it's a very um a pretty closely knit like very supportive community it doesn't feel like I I could just be new enough to it in this Mm -hmm. sense that I don't see drama and stuff like that that might be there well, there's always tension be that might be there but yeah there i guess there's all with artists there's you're some writers i mean you gotta have drama something to write about that's very true but at the moment but it you know really i haven't seen that it seems very supportive and very warm and um and welcoming and i i really appreciate that about being here yeah no it seems i mean looking at it from afar i mean i mean i'm in a place where i'm very a sm- very small place is not a big community of things and like looking and I've seen over the years like looking at Paul's Paul's stuff this kind of community there that I'm kind of jealous mm-hmm. of um and and I think it is kind of important to be in a kind of be that an online community or a you know meet space community but of other mm-hmm. creatives of other musicians of other you know people just to keep that to keep that um yeah the the community and the support and you know comment great comments on facebook like the, yeah <laughs> the, 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 the one there i think it's yeah that was really really special very 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 generous yeah that was very cool so um i know it's really hard uh it's like asking you which is your favorite kid uh you know <laughs> there's a reason there are several reasons why i don't have kids <laughs> i'd probably be that guy looking, looking, at, looking <laughs> like at the, you looking at the songs <laughs> with, uh, do you have a particular you know a particular favorite or something that you think this is this is where i nailed what i've been looking for is this 
you know, this is my sound, this is mm. what I've been hearing in my head, and you know, all those other things that musicians try to do. Have you, have you, <laughs> right. did, you did you nail it on the album? Would you say there's this is you, this is a, a reflection of what you, you're hearing, you're wanting to do? Um, honestly, I, I, I think Louisiana Rain is my favorite song of mine. Um, frankly, the way the recording came out, um, I, don't, I don't know if we had it mic differently, but I also think I was singing in, I, I was having some kind of voice issues one of the days when we were recording, my voice was just really tired. And um, I feel like I was, to compensate for that, I was kind of singing a little, um, I don't know how to, how to describe it, um, kind of like sing a little bit higher up, like a little brighter mm -hmm. than I normally would. Um, and I normally, I kind of like to bring out the deeper, I mean, I'm an alto, but I like to bring out the deeper tones in my voice. And Louisiana Rain came out, I feel like just a little brighter sounding than I, I normally perform it. Um, and because it's a song I really think of as being kind of like, I mean, lyrically and musically, there's a little bit of dissonance in it. And I like it to be kind of gritty and dark sounding, like pretty, but but gritty and, and dark. And um, that's a sound that I really like. That's just kind of a, a vibe that I that I really like. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I feel like that that's that's probably one of my favorite songs. The only other thing is that pinned the like the newest song that I've written that j just barely made it on the album um I feel like I'd like to do a different arrangement of it musically but lyrically I think that might be my best song mm -hmm. um when I was writing it I just feel like I I worked well, I took more time on the lyrics than I have on most of my other songs like I really I wanted them to be like, well crafted and I kind of knew that when once I started writing, I was like, okay, I'm gonna like I want this to be kind of like sharp and like, yeah, I want the words to be just really, really excellent. Um, and I felt I feel like I'm I mean I'm proud of the the lyrics on that song. So I would it'd be great if I could just mash the two things together in the mm -hmm. future, you know, for, um, for the next album or yes, EP next album. or. Yeah. Or whatever you're going to put out. What, one last question. I, I know the album finally, finally is titled On Whatever You Pray, but I know you had some kind of debate about different titles and things yeah. and that was changing. Was that due to the pandemic and the situation you were going through? That, did this reflect finally you know, on whatever you pray? It reflects what you wanted um, from it. Um, I just, yeah, originally I was going to title it. There was a, there was a phrase from pinned, uh, where I say your, your love is a cocktail of Amaro and saccharin. So Amaro is, I mean, obviously I had just moved back from Italy. Right. So, and, and I love Amari, but <laughs> Amaro, Amaro is like a bitter, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like usually like a bitter kind of digestive kind of thing. And it means Amaro means bitter in Italian. And then I was thinking about, you know, just fake, cloyingly sweet, you know, saccharin. And so um, in the song, that's part of the lyric. And uh, so I was going to name it Amaro and Saccharin. And I really liked that. But after a while, I started thinking about kind of the overall feeling of the album and the different songs written at different times. And um, and I also thought about the the accessibility or like the readability of Amaro and Saccharin. And I was just like, I wonder if people are going to know how to pronounce this. And is that going to be kind of annoying? Um, and on whatever you pray is just, it's, I think it's my favorite little phrase from mm -hmm. Tidal Waves. Um, and I felt like it, that kind of um, looming uh, kind of ominous feeling is in a lot of my songs for various mm -hmm. reasons, but it's also, you know, I have um, a few songs on the album that are about like kind of darker aspects of relationships uh, and things. And I just felt like that phrase really 
applied to a lot of the mm -hmm. matter, the subject matter, I guess, on the album and kind of my overall feeling. Um, and also just personally, like in the timing of putting out the album and stuff, it's, it, uh, I guess it felt right to kind of package this album in a way where it's kind of like, okay, I'm kind of, uh, even though the songs were written over the course of several years and there are different relationships and different experiences that are written about um, in the different songs, there are some um, common threads that <laughs> go through those relationships and the subject matter and stuff. And it's something that at this point in my life, it felt kind of good to package that up and with that title mm -hmm. and say like, okay, that like, this is all here and now I'm moving on to the next thing. Um, kind of like, like I can say goodbye to that kind of, uh, yeah, I guess being prey in a way, you know, <laughs> that was, I mean, the kind, you know, in a certain mm -hmm. way that is kind of what I'm saying goodbye mm -hmm. to. Um, and so, yeah, it just felt kind of, um, yeah, little package deal to set aside and say, okay, I can move on to the next, the next phase of life and writing and all that stuff. Well, it's I'll probably still write about that shit though. Like well, I probably yeah. will. <laughs> Keep working it out. Keep working, yeah. Keep working it out. Well, it's certainly, I mean, the album's great. It's great to see you. The, you've got this response from people all over the world sending you things, even if it's making you think, who are you? What, what's going on? You know, in, a, in uh, the best way, in the best way. It's just, uh, I'm just not used to it. Uh, no, it it's uh, great. And obviously there's a lot of things uh, going forward. Uh, I still think you can spray that guitar you've got in the other room green and uh, get away with all it. Right. Well, I'm not. I'm not going to spray paint my my friend's guitar that he's lending me. I think. Uh, I think I'll get my own and I'll deal with it. How you know I what people it. say about guitars, though? It's like, yeah, they're all. They find they find the person. This is the mythical thing about guitars that people go on about. Yeah. And that's just an excuse for us to keep yeah. buying more, I guess. Mm -hmm. is, right. Is, exactly. Like, it followed me home. Exactly. It, it I found me. What I do you want? Do, I couldn't do anything. Okay. Well, thanks very much for all your time, <laughs> Thank Meredith. Thank you so much. Speaking. And thanks, I'll be Chris. listening again to the album and listening out in the future for your, especially this new electric phase. Okay. Sounds fun. good. Nice to chat with you. Okay. I'm going to hit that stop button if I can find it. <laughs>